Hello, I'm Dr. James Thomas, a laryngologist. I'd like to share with you today why you should get a close laryngeal exam if you're a laryngologist, and if you're a patient, why you want one. There are five keys to getting a great exam. Getting the best laryngoscope that you can afford, if possible, a chip on the tip scope. Digitally recording so you can go back and look at the vocal cords in slow motion because what transpires happens so quickly with them. Today's topic of a close exam, and many times you need topical anesthesia to get that close exam. And lastly, manipulating the voice to see the details you want to see. On to today's topic. This topic came up when I received this handout from a company selling some new equipment. Now, I don't want to go into what the equipment is or this company in particular, but I saw these two photos and they made me realize here is a huge medical technology company spending massive amounts of money on advertising and they're showing these two pictures to try to convince me to buy all this equipment or the hospital. Does the hospital want to spend money on something? Are they convinced that if you go from here to here, you've gotten rid of the problem? I'm not convinced. This is papilloma, these little bumps that grow on the vocal cord. And this, while a typical laryngology view, I think might be inadequate to persuade you to buy this very expensive equipment. Because is the papilloma gone here? I have no clue. Let me tell you a story about a patient of mine. Now, she's 35 years old. She's had papilloma since age six. That is, it recurs. That's very common. It's a virus that grows on the vocal cord, creates warts, those little bumps you saw. And she's had a number of surgeries. Now, four years ago, the same laryngologist changed her diagnosis from papilloma to GERD, acid reflux laryngitis. He put her on Nexium. And surprisingly, she didn't get better or perhaps not so surprisingly, since what are the chances that those warts went away and now she has acid bothering her, her vocal cords? Here I am examining her vocal cords. Now I want to state that this is a typical view of the vocal cords. That is, it's a safe view of the vocal cords, but is it an adequate view? We're above the epiglottis. We can avoid gagging the person. Bill, come here a minute. Now, you may remember Bill. He's my half head who can show us what we do with a typical exam. We pass the endoscope in through the nose, along the bottom, and we get to the back and we turn the corner. Now from there, we see the vocal cords, and that's the view we have here. We're safe because we're not in this area of the pharynx where we might gag the person. But our view is far away. How do we get closer? Let me have Bill help us again. When we get here, even if we don't have topical anesthesia, or better if we do, we can pass the endoscope down along the back wall, and because it's a flexible instrument, when we get here, we can start to curve it. And when we curve it, we will start to see along the vocal cords and get a great detailed view. I had them say E because it makes the epiglottis stand up. So while they're saying E, I'm actually not really looking at the vocal cords. I'm advancing my endoscope in. And I get closer and closer to the vocal cords, and then when the person takes a breath, I get a pretty darn good detailed view. If we look at this view, we see a couple of abnormalities. We see some bumps here and some little red dots here. And I'll go into more detail. I watch more of the film. These bumps go away. It's mucus. She coughs it out. That's why it's important to look at the whole video. But these bumps here, these little red dots, this fullness here, never changes. And because this is on the vocal cord, it's what's impairing her vocal cord vibrations. What do you think? Here's my initial view. Same person a few moments later as I get the scope up close, which one convinces us that there might be a problem on the vocal cords? I want to tell you why I think laryngologists get confused with this acid reflux thing. Here is your swallowing tube. And the vocal cords are lined with something called mucosa. That is, a very thin translucent layer of skin that we can see through. And underneath that, we see little blood vessels running. Well, if you tip that up on its side and you have this translucent membrane and your light shining down through all those vessels stacked one on top of the other, the whole thing begins to look red. So anywhere that the mucosa is parallel to your plane of vision, 
we start to see these red spots. Well, that's an artifact of photography. That is not acid gurgling up from your stomach and landing here and here. So let's not be distracted by that. Let's get in close and take a look at the actual pathology. Now I also turned on a strobe light. That changes the characteristics of the light. And I actually think it helps show a little bit better these little red dots. Pathognomonic, that is, they are what papilloma has every time. So let's take her to the operating room. Here's the image. Well, hmm, that is what papilloma is. When we get this close, we not only see that these are red dots, we actually see that they are little U's. The papilloma on the surface is bumpy, looks like cauliflower, and inside every cell of papilloma, it attracts a capillary that grows up and back down, and that's how we get these dots. But here we're looking at one from the side, and we can see the U shape of papilloma. To take this off, I bring in a microscope, and that way I have room to operate some instruments with my hands and a CO2 laser. And we're going to cut off this papilloma. But first, let's compare the operating room view to what I consider a good exam in the office. The same patient, color's a little different. This is the microscope. I've turned it upside down because in the operating room, I'm sitting behind the person, and in the office, I'm sitting in front of the person. And if we flip it upside down, that's the same thing. We can see the papilloma here and here. And our view in the office is almost identical, if not sometimes better, than the operating microscope view. Let's take off the lesion. I'm going to do two steps. One is to inject some adrenaline into the vocal cord. Adrenaline, epinephrine, makes the blood vessels constrict. There'll be less bleeding. I'll be able to see clearer because I want to cut along the edge of this otherwise bloody lesion. And secondly, when I put this in called hydrodissection, this process of sticking fluid in the vocal cord, separates out the muscle from the papilloma. It gives me more room to cut and preserve the underlying layers. I'm using a CO2 laser set very low, 2 watts, and I'm cutting just through the layer of skin. I'm actually not burning the papilloma at all. And then I remove it and preserve all of the underlying uh, muscle and, if possible, the lamina propria. We'll go back to the 70 degree endoscope and look at what I've done. We are so close to the vocal cord in this picture, we can actually see the thickness of the layer of skin. And if possible, we preserve some of this lubricating layer so that this skin is going to grow back over top of this and we'll have a vocal cord that vibrates when we're done. This is three and a half years later, I'm going to continue the story. She's had a couple of other procedures to remove the papilloma as it grows back. And it's been a year since her last visit, and she says, well, I feel like I'm having some effort speaking, and there's something down there. I think the papilloma is back. Here's our typical view from far above. A little bit hazy, I have her swallow. That clears up the view. And there's our typical view from high above. Does she have papilloma? I don't know. We need to get closer. I have her say E, move my endoscope in, get it down near the vocal cords, and then I start turning the endoscope and looking along the edge of the vocal cords to see if there's any papilloma. Well, I see some scar tissue because I've operated on it before, and some of these blood vessels growing in are just from scar, but there's four or five cells of papilloma there. They are the little red dots. We'll go ahead and treat these in a minute, but first, let's go back to our advertisement. Now, I, I know this is a half-tone image, so it's not great, but do you believe that there's no papilloma here? Do you believe that this instrument worked? I have no way of judging unless they show me a picture like this. We'll continue on, we'll use a strobe light, and we look for any disruption of the mucosal wave, and it appears that it's a little bit dampened there, so we'll go ahead and treat it. We use what's called a pulse dye laser. This particular laser is absorbed best by blood, and since the papilloma has those little bloody vessels in the center of it, when I fire the laser, the papilloma absorbs the energy, and it gets coagulated, burned, if we do close exams, we'll catch it when it's a tiny amount before it gets to be spread all over the place. I'd like to ask you what you think of a close laryngeal exam. What's it worth? I'm Dr. James Thomas.